This is lecture 13 for Chem 223. Today we're going to be talking about electrodes and redox reactions. What I have here is a picture of what we call a standard hydrogen electrode. So the reduction potentials of every reaction are measured relative to this electrode. So we define this electrode as having a reduction potential of zero. What does that mean? Does that mean that this system has no reduction potential? No, it means that we actually don't have a good way of measuring absolute reduction potentials. So all reduction potentials are just measured relative to each other. And this guy, the standard hydrogen electrodes reduction potential is what defines that overall. So the way this works is this is just protons dissolved in water at a concentration of one molar. And these will interact with hydrogen gas that's bubbled into this electrode. And this gas is kept at a pressure of one bar. And so then if the protons in the solution get reduced by picking up electrons from this wire that's just sticking in here, then they will form hydrogen gas, which will come back out. If you're driving the reaction in the opposite way, then the hydrogen gas will come in here and give up electrons to the system and form protons. And so whether you are forming protons or forming hydrogen gas depends on the reduction potential of the other species, so the species in the other half cell. So how do we use the hydrogen electrode to make measurements? Uh, well, we have a setup that looks like this, where on the left here, you'll see we have our hydrogen electrode. We have some gas bubbling into the solution. We have a, an acidic solution started at one molar uh, H plus concentration, so that would be a very low pH, right? That'd be a pH of zero. And then we have this platinum wire running over here to our other electrode. So in here, what we call the hydrogen electrode is our reference electrode. So the reference electrode is the electrode that you know the potential of. And then you have another half cell or another electrode which you're trying to measure the potential of, and we call that our indicator electrode. So in this case, we know the standard reduction potential of the standard hydrogen electrode here on our left. We know that it is zero, and that means that any potential we meet, read on our potentiometer here, this 0 0.799 volts, is only correlated with the reaction happening in the right electrode. So if you'll remember the way we figure out the uh, reaction uh, reduction potential is we take the species being reduced, subtract the potential of species being oxidized, and that gives us this value. But since we know that the potential of the oxidized species is zero, or if we're using a different electrode and we knew the uh, potential of that uh, reference electrode, then we could just solve this equation right here to figure out the potential of our indicator electrode. Now this all has a problem though, and that is that the potentials on either side depend on the concentration of the silver and protons in the solution. And as we run this experiment, so here I have the Nernst equation written out, right, where I have the standard reaction potential here have the number of electrons, which is two, and I have the concentrations of these two species, and they're both squared because of these equations down here. But as this reaction proceeds, the concentration of your protons and the concentration of your silver ions is going to vary. So how do you know at what point to make your measurement of the potential? Right, so let's say we're trying to solve for the concentration of one of these. How are we gonna know at any given time what it is? And you can do some complicated math and use some complicated logic and experiments to figure that out. But a better way is actually to design at least a reference electrode that has a constant concentration. And so how do we do that? Well, we use what's called a saturated electrode. And so here in this left square, what I have is the saturated silver chloride electrode. So the way that this works is we have a silver bar in here, and when 
the silver gets reduced, so when it sends electrons over here to the right side, then the silver on the surface of this, gar of this bar becomes positively charged. And when it becomes positively charged, it complexes with chloride ions found in the solution. Now, how do we keep then the concentration of chloride ions constant in this left side of this cell? Well, the way we do it is we saturate it with potassium chloride. What saturated means is we add enough uh, potassium chloride in there <coughs> to where there's too much for it all to dissolve in the solution. Okay, now then if everything is saturated in here, let's say that our silver gets reduced and a little bit of our chloride ions complex with that silver bar, then what happens? Well, now we have a little more space in our solution for some more potassium chloride to dissolve. And so it <coughs> maintains that saturated concentration of potassium chloride in it. And let's say now that we, instead of giving electrons to the left or to the right, let's say some of the electrons come from the right into the left and we have now neutralized the silver on our bar and chlorine ions are popping off of here. Well, now we have extra chloride ions in our solution so some of those will just complex with potassium in the solution and crash out into the bottom. So by having this saturated solution here, we are keeping the concentration on the left constant. All right, <clears throat> so to restate that, the composition in the left is constant. The cell potential changes depends only on the right here. So if we write out this uh, Nernst equation for this reaction, we have the concentration of iron two plus and iron three plus here because in this reaction we're actually not plating anything we're just reducing iron three plus to iron two plus or if we reverse that uh, reaction going from iron two plus to iron three plus which are both aqueous and solution and we have this platinum wire in here because platinum is a relatively neutral metal and it generally doesn't like to undergo oxidation or reduction if something else can be oxidized or reduced. And so we have the concentration of our iron 2 plus and 3 plus in this reaction. We also have the concentration of our chloride ion that's coming from our saturated cell. But again, since this guy is saturated, its concentration is going to be constant. And so this value of chlorine minus is not actually going to be changing over time. Now, it's not always very convenient to set up a big experiment like this, especially if you're just trying to quickly measure the potential of a solution or something like that. So instead of always setting up this beaker with the salt bridge and the bar and everything, we actually condense everything in this uh, dashed line to a simple probe that looks like this. So it's just got your wire coming in here and let's actually look at a schematic view of what's going on here. Um, so in this probe, we have our silver chloride saturated solution. That's this uh, gray area. And we have a silver bar stuck in here with a wire coming out. And now this silver bar then can be oxidized or reduced to gain or complex with the chloride ions or release them back into the solution. And then we have this solid uh, potassium chloride or silver chloride plug down here. And this is what, uh, this is the powder that will then dissolve up here if it gets too concentrated. And the salt bridge actually in this case is this little blue part right here. So anytime you actually stick one of these probes into water or into a solution, the salt bridge right here actually does leak a little bit of ions into your solution. And then we have a little air inlet in here, and that is just to maintain pressure in here. Now, this guy still, though, has to be connected to a potentiometer and have another wire going into your solution. And so this is what it actually looks like in practice. You have your probe, and that plugs into this potentiometer, and then the potentiometer has another wire leading into your solution. I also want to highlight right here, I have the line notation for the half cell inside the anode. You'll notice this one actually has uh, three spots on it or two of these lines. So what's going on here, it's not as scary as it looks. You have the silver going to silver plus, 
and that's your actual oxidation reduction going on. And then the chloride ion in this case is actually just a spectator. And so we just have the silver, silver plus here, and then the spectator is going to go on the right. I think there is a sampling question that has something like that in it. Uh, and if you need further help on those problems, I recommend just Googling how to write line notation for different, uh, different scenarios. All right, another electrode that we often use is called the saturated calomel electrode. So this is very similar to the saturated silver chloride electrode. The only difference here is that instead of using silver chloride, we're actually using mercury and chloride. And so this has liquid mercury in a test tube with a little bit of glass wool at the bottom of this. And glass wool will not let the mercury diffuse through it, but it will let potassium chloride solution in the outside here diffuse into it. And so it's got this little hole that holds in the glass wool, and the glass wool then holds in the uh, mercury above it. And the nice thing about this uh, mercurious chloride or calomel electrode, so calomel is actually just the name of this HD2Cl2 uh, compound. But the nice thing about it is with the silver chloride electrode, you can really only interact with the surface of the silver bar, but because this is a liquid in here and what you'll get is as this mercurious chloride forms at this junction right here where the potassium chloride and mercury meet that mercurious chloride can then diffuse through the whole chlor or the whole mercury solution in here and so this thing basically has uh, a lot more surface area or a lot more reaction time than the silver chloride electrode but then the trade-off, of course, is you have to use toxic mercury, and there's price considerations and some other experimental considerations to keep in mind when choosing your electrode. Uh, and then down here, again, you still have this potassium chloride plug down here that will uh, allow potassium chloride to dissolve in the solution, and you have your salt bridge, which is also sometimes called a porous plug down here. All right, so right now what I want you to do is actually pause this video and draw a saturated calomel electrode. Make sure you know all of the parts and what they're called and why they need to be in there. Go ahead and pause the video if you haven't done that yet. All right, hopefully you drew that out. It's also a good idea to do the same thing with the standard hydrogen electrode and with the saturated silver chloride electrode. Um, but your chloride or your saturated calomel electrode should have looked something like this. Now, of course, you don't have to use color, but uh, every once in a while, I do have a student that brings colored pencils into an exam. Makes it look great. All right, now, one of the issues associated with the saturated silver chloride or saturated calomel electrodes is that their potentials are not zero like the standard hydrogen. So the standard or saturated calomel electrode actually has a reduction potential of 0.241 volts. Um, so how do we deal with that when measuring the potential of other species? So for example, let's say we're trying to find the half cell reduction potential for going from copper two plus to copper. Well, if we measured that reduction potential with the saturated hydrogen or the standard hydrogen electrode, we'd get a reduction potential of 0.339 volts for this reaction. And so what I have on this number line is just volts, and I've put the standard hydrogen electrode at zero volts, and then I have put the copper two plus copper reaction over here at 0.339 volts where we actually measure that. But if I measured the potential with the copper, or for the copper two plus copper reaction, with a saturated silver chloride electrode. The saturated silver chloride electrode has a potential of 0 0.197 volts. And so the difference between that electrode and this copper two plus copper reaction is only 0 0.142 volts. And if I measured with the standard calomel electrode, which has a potential of 0 0.241 volts, then we'd actually only measure a 
half cell reaction potential of 0 0.098 volts for this copper two plus two copper reaction. So how do we go from a measurement that we make with the standard cow metal electrode to the standard, um, the standard range or the standard method for reporting these, which is relative to the standard hydrogen electrode? Well, what we're actually going to have to do is if we're trying to convert from the standard calomel electrode to the standard hydrogen electrode, we would have to add the potential of the saturated calomel electrode to any value we measure. So for example, if we wanna go from 0 0.098 volts to 0 0.339 volts, we would have to add this value of 0 0.241 volts, which is the potential of the silver silver chloride electrode or saturated silver chloride electrode. And in the opposite direction, if we're going from the saturated or the standard hydrogen electrode to the saturated silver chloride electrode, we would then have to subtract the potential of the saturated silver chloride electrode. All right, to see if you understand that, I'm gonna pose this question to you. I'm gonna give you these two half cell reactions and ask which of them has a higher half cell reduction potential. You'll notice that this chlorine reaction was measured with a saturated calomel electrode, and this platinum reaction was measured with a, of a standard hydrogen electrode. So take a minute, think about that, and you'll probably need these numbers right here, which are the, the potentials for the standard hydrogen electrode, the a uh, saturated silver chloride electrode and the saturated calomel electrode. So go ahead and pause the video now and see if you can figure this problem. All right, so hopefully what you did was converted one of these electrode measurements to the reference frame of another reference electrode. So I'm going to convert the chlorine reaction from the standard or saturated calomel electrode to the standard hydrogen electrode. I'm going to do that by simply adding 0 0.241 volts to the value obtained with the saturated calomel electrode to get 1.36 volts for the standard hydrogen electrode. So now we can directly compare the platinum value to the chlorine value, and we see that chlorine has a higher half cell reduction potential. If you have any problems with that, feel free to reach out to me and let me know. All right. Now let's move on to another type of probe here. This is the pH probe. And believe it or not, the pH probe is actually functioning on uh, reduction oxidation reaction um, principles. So the way a pH probe works is we start with this glass tube. And at the bottom, we have this very thin membrane. And this is where most of the magic happens in our, uh, <laughs> in our probe. And so what happens here on this membrane is it's a somewhat porous piece of glass, though we're not going to think of things entering or leaving it. What we're going to think about are things sticking to the surface or being removed from the surface and things moving inside the glass. So again, things are going to stick to the surface, but they're not going to go in the surface. Things are going to move through the glass, but the things moving through the glass are not going to exit or enter the glass. They're just gonna stay in there. So what happens is if you put this probe in an acidic solution, then the surface of the glass, which has a bunch of O minus groups sticking out into solution, that's true actually of all glass. So if you get a glass and fill it full of water and drink that, the glass in that, or the surface of your glass in that, in that cup is uh, actually covered in O minus groups. And then once you drink the water out, the protons actually stick back on there to neutralize them. But anyways, if protons stick to the surface of this glass, glass generally has sodium and potassium and a few other ions dissolved in the glass. And if you put a bunch of extra protons on the outside, you're increasing your probability that they'll stick to the surface of the glass. And as you get more proton buildup on the surface, that causes your sodium ions to then want to get away from the surface. So they will actually migrate through the glass closer to the other side. And as they build up charge on this other side, that makes protons on the other side of the glass less likely to stick around, so they'll pop off. 
And so they'll pop off inside this probe into this uh, saturated potassium fluoride solution here. And so as we are adding protons here, we're actually changing the amount of positive charge in the solution. And so we need a way to balance that out. And so what we have is this wire going through here with a silver bar in it. And so as we're building up charge in here, what we need to do is then build up negative charge as well. And so this silver chloride probe will actually pop off Cl minus ions into the solution to balance out that positive charge. But the only way it can do that is by pulling electrons down through this wire to neutralize that silver uh, or the silver plus ions on that bar. So where are those electrons coming from? Well, we actually then put a second glass tube around this first one. And this one is actually also filled with this uh, KCL saturated solution. Um, and these solutions I should also mention are buffered to pH seven. Uh, and this second solution actually has its own silver wire in it. And so if this side needs electrons flowing down into it so it can pop off chlorine ions to balance out that positive charge, then this one has to give electrons to it. So the electrons flow up one side and then back down the other side. And what we actually measure is the current or flow of electrons moving from one side to the other. And so then if this guy is giving off electrons, that means that it's building up positive charge on its surface. And so that means it is picking up Cl minus ions from the solution. Um, if it does that though, then we're building up a, or we're depleting the negative charge from the solution on this side. So we have to gain that back by putting a little porous junction in this guy. So this guy will actually act as a salt bridge that'll either pick up ions or give off ions depending on which way the electrons are flowing. And so anytime you stick a pH probe into a solution, you're actually leaking a small amount of ions into that solution. Okay, so let's review all of that. If I stick this in an acidic solution, that means there's extra protons floating around this bulb, which means the protons are more likely to stick to the surface of this glass. And since this has a very thin membrane, that means we'll be able to see the sodium migrating through here. And by that, I mean we'll be able to measure its effects. So as the protons build up here, sodium is gonna push through the glass to the other side, make it less favorable for protons on the other side to stick. They'll pop off in this solution, increasing the positive charge. We then need to balance that positive charge by losing chloride ions from this silver chloride bar. To do that, we'll have to neutralize the silver plus on this bar by taking electrons from the other side. If we're taking electrons from this side, that means we have a bunch of silver plus ions in the bar, which means chloride minus will attach to it, and we will have a depletion of negative charge in here, so we'll pick that up from the surrounding solution up here. Now, if the opposite happens, let's say we stick this into a basic solution, so you gotta remember in a basic solution, you have a depletion of protons. And so what that means is on our surface here, you'll have less probability of picking up protons. So protons will leave here. And since you already have some charge on either side of the glass, the sodium inside the glass will go, hey, now there's less protons on here. Plus it'll see all the negative charge of these oxygens. It'll wanna flow towards them. And that will make it more favorable to pick up protons on the interior of the glass here. And so you will get a depletion of positive charge. In that case, you'll have to neutralize that by having your chloride minus ions attached to your silver bar, which means you'll need to remove some electrons from your silver bar and they will come over to this side, neutralize silver on this side, and the chloride ions will pop off over here and you'll balance out charge through this salt bridge. Okay, go ahead again and pause the video, draw a pH probe and explain to yourself how it works. If you can't explain how it works, then go back and rewatch that uh, lecture that I just gave on it. And if that's not helpful, make sure to turn to the textbook for answers as well. If you still can't get it, feel free to reach out to me or to the rest of the class for help. 
All right, so hopefully you paused there and drew out your pH probe. And this is what you should have gotten. I won't go through it again because I just went through it a whole bunch. But uh, hopefully you understand how this works and could replicate it. Now, there are a lot of potential errors that can creep in when making measurements with pH electrodes. The first is that the, uh, the current that you're getting, that you're relating to pH, has to be calibrated using a set of standards. And so if there's any problem with your standards, so let's say you're using standards at pH of 4, 7, and 10, which are pretty close to what people use most of the time, and the actual pHs of those solutions are 4.2, 6.8, and 10.2, then your calibration is going to be thrown off. So there's calibration errors that are very common. Right? There's something called the sodium error. And although we named it after sodium, this can apply actually to any positively charged ions in your solution. Since your glass is covered with negative charge, with those O minus groups. If you have positive charge carriers, such as sodium plus or potassium plus, so by positive charge carrier, I just mean any positively charged species in there, all of those species are going to want to interact with your bulb. So let's say you put your pole or your pH electrode into a really salty solution, what's going to happen is that the sodium plus or other positively charged ions in that salt solution are going to stick to your probe and that's going to trick your probe into thinking it's got a bunch of protons on the end of it, even though it's actually just got a bunch of other ions on the end of it. And that'll give you a false pH reading. And additionally, there's something called acid error, which is kind of like the sodium error. But the acid error is when you have too many uh, protons in your solution. And what you end up doing is saturating the surface of your pH probe. So basically you fill it up until there's no more room to fit additional protons on there. And in that case, you just stop measuring accurate pHs. So let's say you, the actual pH is negative one and your pH electrode saturates at pH one, then you're just gonna measure a pH of one even though the pH is actually a lot lower. Okay, the next type of error we're gonna talk about is all right, you can also get errors associated with the temperature. So the temperature is going to change the current of the electrodes as they go from one wire to the other. It's also actually going to dramatically affect the rate at which sodium can migrate through the glass in this bulb. And so you generally want to calibrate your pH at the same temperature as the temperature of your solution. So let's say you're measuring the pH of an Arctic lake, then you should just bring your your reference standards with you so you can calibrate it there. Another type of error is type of glass. Different types of glass have different limits uh, for their acid error or the other side which is called your base error which is where you basically deplete every spot on the glassware of protons you can't deplete anymore. And so you can see different types of glassware here are labeled with different letters. And most glassware is usually pretty good at measuring uh, low pH values, but there's quite a few of them that actually do fairly poorly with measuring bases. All right. You can also ruin your probe by letting it dry out. That'll just cause the uh, probe to get wildly out of calibration and it can ruin the porous junction on the probe. And the last, error is what's called a junction potential. Now this one is a little more complicated and it's actually unavoidable. And let me show you what that is in a graphic. And this actually appears in every type of electrode measurement. You have some form of junction potential in there. And junction potentials are caused by different ions tra uh, traveling at different rates. So as you can see, and I'll back it up and do that again, here in this diagram, the negatively charged ions are moving more quickly than the positively charged ions. That doesn't necessarily depend on whether it's positively or negatively charged, uh, but it can depend on, for example, the size of the ion, the magnitude of the charge. So let's say it's a two plus versus a one plus, et cetera. 
but this different rate of diffusion for different charge carriers causes a potential and that is what we call the junction potential. So all ions diffuse at different rates and some diffuse at relatively similar rates and so you can reduce some of that junction potential but you really can't eliminate it. And so this charge separation is what adds that junction potential. So the junction potential is usually just a few millivolts uh, occurring at both ends of your salt bridge. If you have a salt bridge and uh, generally has to do with diffusion of solution or the diffusion of ions through your solution. So let's say you're measuring with a saturated silver chloride electrode. Well, the concentration of ions right around the electrode is actually going to be slightly different than the concentration of ions in the rest of the solution. So often you need to add a stir bar to make sure that the ions are moving towards that probe at a reasonable rate. And this is actually a systematic error, but it's of an unknown value, and there's usually not a great way to measure it. So your ion composition is almost always different between two samples. So let's say you're trying to calibrate this using reference standards to eliminate this junction potential. So that's one way of getting around this, but it's really hard to match the actual ion concentration in one solution and the other. Um, and so there's often just no good way to measure the junction potential. And we often just live with it being present. All right, so that does it for our electrodes for today. Now we are going to move on to balancing uh, redox reactions. And we're going to start just with an example reaction here. So this is chromate reacting with I minus. And this is giving us the CR3 plus and I2 um, species as products. And we want to balance this. As you can see, there's clearly two chromiums on the left, one chromium on the right, one iodine on the left, two on the right. And there's some oxygen over here that's not over here. And the charge is definitely not balanced throughout this reaction. So what we're gonna have to do is first, identify our redox species and then once we have those uh, identified split them into half reactions. So now I have my chromate and CR3 plus in one reaction I have my I minus and my I2 in one reaction. Then we are going to balance these half reactions. Once we balance these half reactions we're almost done. Okay, so the first thing we're gonna do is balance the redox species. So you'll see I put a two on this chromate here now because there's two chromate or chromiums on the left, so there needs to be two chromiums on the right, and I put this two in front of the I minus to balance out with this I2. The next thing we're going to do is balance out our oxygens with water. So what that means is we're going to look in this reaction and in the other reaction, look for any oxygens. So there's only oxygens in this top reaction, but there's seven of them. So we need to add seven oxygens on the right. Okay, now that we've added oxygens in the form of water though, we've also added a bunch of hydrogens. So we're going to balance out those hydrogens with protons, all right? So we've balanced out the hydrogens with 14 protons. And the last thing that we need to do is balance our charge with electrons. So what that means is we're going to count up the charge on the left, and here we have 14 times plus one uh, plus negative two, so that's 14 minus two, so we have a total of 12 plus on the left, and on the right, we just have two times three plus, so we have six plus on the right. So how do we get from, get 12 plus to equal six plus? Well, we're gonna to have to add six electrons here on the left. All right, and then down here on the bottom, we have two minus on the left, and we have no charge on the right, so we'll need to add some negative charge to the right in the form of electrons. Okay, now there's one more step to balancing this reaction. And we get to skip this step because I said this is an acidic solution. 
And that is that if we're in a basic solution, we're gonna neutralize all these protons with OH minus. And I'll give you an example of how to do that on the next slide. But here, I told you it was acidic, so you don't have to do that. Now, a few of you now are gonna think, well, how do I know if it's acidic or basic? I'll have to tell you that. And the stoichiometry of these can change whether you run the reaction in an acidic or basic solution. And so, I, again, I'll just have to tell you whether it's acidic or basic. But since this is an acidic reaction, we're gonna skip step E here. And then the next thing we need to do is make sure that this, we can take this top reaction, add it to this bottom reaction, and all of our electrons will cancel out. And so to do that, we're going to have to multiply. And so this top guy has six electrons, the bottom one has two. We can't divide this top whole reaction by three to make those even out. If we could, we, or if this could all divide by three, then we could just do that. But since that would give a bunch of these guys uh, non-integer values. What we're gonna have to do is multiply this bottom reaction by three. So we get those values. And then we're just going to add this top reaction with this bottom one into a single reaction that looks like this. Now, we need to cancel out things that appear on the left and on the right. So we have some electrons on the left and on the right, those cancel out, and so our reaction simplifies to this, right? It looks really messy. It is really messy, and it is really complicated. So you need to get these steps down in your head. So this is slightly different than how it's done in the appendix that you have to read. Um, if the method described in the appendix makes a little more sense to you, then it's fine to use that method. This is the method that I like. I think it's a little more straightforward than the other. And you can just memorize the number of steps a little more simply, I think. Um, and then the last thing you are gonna wanna do is double check that our stoichiometry and charge works out, okay? So you can see we have six iodines up here. We have uh, 14 protons on either side, right? We have 14 on the left and then seven times two, which is 14 on the right. We have two chromiums on the left, two on the right. We have seven oxygens on the left, seven on the right. And then of course, we want to double check our charge to make sure it is balanced. So we have 14 plus uh, minus two, so we're at 12 plus minus six, which would get us at, at at six plus, and then on the right, we have just this six plus and nothing else. So we have six plus on the left, six plus on the right, and that all works out. All right, now I will give you an example of balancing a basic, or a basic redox reaction. I'm going to go through the steps a little more quickly just because we just went through them, and really I just need to emphasize this step 3E right here. All right, but let's start with this reaction, CN minus plus iron three plus going to CNO minus and iron two plus, and we'll do this in a basic solution. So again, we're going to identify the redox species and divide into half cell reactions. So here we have the CN minus going to CNO minus, and we have iron three plus going to iron two plus. And then we're gonna have to balance each of these half cell reactions. We're gonna start by balancing oxygens with water. So the only oxygen here is CNO. So we just have to put one oxygen on the left there. We're gonna to have to balance out the hydrogens with protons. So we only have the two hydrogens from this water in this reaction. So we just have to add two protons on the right. And then we're going to balance our charge with electrons. So we'll count up the charge on either side and add the appropriate number of electrons. You can just trust that I did that correctly here. And then if it's basic, we need to neutralize the protons with OH minus. And that's, or this is how we do that. We basically just add the same amount of OH minus to either side of this reaction. Um, so here we have two protons on the right of this reaction. We don't have any other protons anywhere else in either of these two reactions. So we're gonna add two hydroxides to the left here. 
Um, but we can't just make up hydroxides, so we're going to add two hydroxides to the right as well. Um, and then all we're going to do after that is multiply everything if necessary. So we need to multiply this iron reaction by two. Now there should be uh, two electrons on the top reaction. We cancel out two electrons down here. And there's going to be two protons on the top that are going to react with the two hydroxides on the bottom left here. We'll then just add these guys all together and we'll get a reaction that looks like this. Again, our electrons can cancel out, but here we have something else that can cancel out. We actually have protons and hydroxides on a single side of this reaction, and those can combine together to get us water. Now we have two waters on the right of this reaction and only one on the left, so we're going to cancel out the one on the left and one of the ones on the right to uh, get down to one water. So then we can rewrite this all out, and we're going to get a reaction that looks like this. And then, of course, you'll double check your stoichiometry and your charge. If you have any questions about any of that, feel free to reach out to me and let me know. All right, we're going to finish off today by uh, going through a practice problem for you. So I want you to try and work through this reaction. I'm not going to go through all the steps when I work it out. Uh, but I want you to try and balance this acidic redox reaction. Go ahead and pause the video and I will go through the solution here in a second. All right, so like I said, I'm not going to go through all of the steps, but you should have gotten to this point where you have six electrons plus 14 protons plus a bunch of chromate going to Cr3 plus and water, and you should have gotten six iron 2 plus six iron three plus and six electrons for the iron reaction. You add those all together and cancel things out. You should get a reaction that looks like this. If you didn't get that reaction, try and work through it again. If you didn't get that stoichiometry, try to work through it again and see if you can figure out what you did wrong. Once you did that, you'll be a strong, confident woman.